Um, Francesca joined the Guggenheim Museum staff in 2010 to co-lead the Panzer Collection Initiative together with Jeffrey. She came to the museum from the Dia Art Foundation here in New York, where she served at the organization's first conservator. From 2001 to 2006, Francesca worked in a similar capacity at the Cinetti Foundation in Marfa. Jeffrey is an independent curator and critic in New York and holds a position as adjunct professor at the NYU Institute of Fine Arts. From 2010 to 2017, he was a senior curator at the Guggenheim Museum, where he curated several exhibitions, including the acclaimed on Kavar show Silence. We feel honored that Jeffrey and Francesca have agreed to share with us some of their findings from the highly complex and precedent-setting Panzer Collection Initiative today. So please welcome the two. And we're honored to be here, and thank you for the invitation. We should at least get that. Very and much. I, um, to uh, Christian and his team, who have been amazing, um, we're, we're very grateful, and uh, we appreciate very much the opportunity to be here and to share some of our work with you in this setting. And yeah, Francesca and I have a way of finishing each other's sentences. We're going to present yeah. together. <laughs> if it gets annoying, I apologize. But this kind of how it is for us in the context of this project, because it was such a close collaboration. We'll get to that in a minute. Sorry. But we, we just wanted to start off actually picking up on a thread that was uh, begun at the conclusion of the discussion um, before lunch, which was when Christian um, mentioned having recently seen the Nauman retrospective that just opened in Basel, Switzerland, and mentioned um, something about Nauman's acceptance of exhibition copies of his works in neon. And I wanted to, we, we actually didn't have this slide in our, the final draft of our talk. We had it in an earlier draft, um, but took it out because to be honest, this slide, which represents four different exhibition copies of a work in the Guggenheim Panza collection, Nun Sing Neon Sign, which is from 1970, we recognize that this slide alone could probably be a 30-minute talk all on its own about Nauman's positions around exhibition copies, the technology of neon, um, and questions around you know, exhibition copies generally. So we, we removed it, and I just thought it was a, an interesting thread um, based on Christian's comment, because of course Nauman does accept this, but it, it's sort of not as simple, unfortunately. Uh, and it's, it's something that's echoed throughout a lot of the work we've done on the Ponza Collection. Yeah, there are maybe five things going on here that you'll be, that we'll be addressing as we move through the rest of our presentation uh, that have to do with the question of exhibition copies, which I think should be Christian's next theme <laughs> for, uh, because there's a lot of skeletons in that closet, as we all know, and it's a very, very complicated problem for us in the community. Uh, not, not, not a simple thing at all, but actually tricky to say the least, um, but also the question of, uh, of artists and what they say and when they say it, and this idea of approval being something that we tend to reflexively want, although it doesn't always take us to the, we, some of us may feel to the right place. So that's something else we, we want to bring up later in what we, what we do for you starting now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and <clears throat> we can advance and Sure. I think we just to basically give you the, the, the framework is that um, Francesca and I have been working on for six or seven years on this uh, study project at the Guggenheim called the Panza Collection Initiative, which is a collaboration. It was modeled or planned to be uh, a collaboration between conservation and art history and curator, curatorship. Uh, uh, a project that was, that was um, devoted to that partnership, that idea of a partnership and the two fields kind of being, being brought together to intersect. And it's, and it's the, the study is um, basically um, concerns itself with the many, many works uh, in the Guggenheim collection that were acquired from Giuseppe Panza, who was a great collector of minimal and post-minimal and conceptual art in the 1970s. The acquisition of, of a large holding from Panza was made by the Guggenheim in the early 90s. And many, many years later, um, we entered the picture uh, because we were brought to the museum as a team to execute this study project, which was partly funded by the Guggenheim and in collaboration then with also the Mellon Foundation. Uh, and on this occasion, we should also thank our other associate who's not here, Ted Mann, an assistant curator who did a tremendous amount of work with us. Uh, on this project as well. And we can also <coughs> thank um, the advisory committee that we worked with throughout the project and many of whom are actually in the audience with us. But we wanted to just highlight that the project thus far has consisted of two um, separate three-year phases. 
Um, the first mm -hmm. phase uh, looking at the five artists on this slide and the second phase looking at um, another series of artists and also attempting to begin um, some implementation of findings that were determined in the first phase. We wanted to give a tiny bit of additional context about Ponza um, himself, and in fact, he and his wife, Giovanna Ponza, were extremely active together in formulating the collection. They were, you know, quite um, visionary in the kind of breadth and scope and content of the collection that they amass. It was primi primarily of American art, um, contemporaneously as they began to collect in the 1950s and extending into the 1990s. And they, um, did this out of their villa north of Milan in <coughs> Varese, Italy. And I don't know if I can do this on the slide, but does that show yes, up? Yes, you can. Yeah, so this was a wing of um, former stables that extended out um, beyond the villa itself, and they um, exhibited the collection within, of course, the residence, but also went on to engage with many artists um, in the 1970s to cite um, and install permanent installations in the stables, which are in fact still um, on view today, and um, some of which are part of the Ponza acquisition that are part of the Guggenheim Holdings, so we uh, ad remotely administer, um, kind of in name only, um, some works that are still on permanent view at Varese, but they're quite significant. One of them is even the uh, first Sky Space by James Turrell, so there's quite interesting work still on view there. Yes, and <clears throat> before we leave Ponzo altogether, oh, he's going to come back a lot, but before we leave this moment in the presentation, I think it's important to say that we're going to say a lot of things, or some things anyway, about um, moves and, and, and actions that Ponza made and took in the course of his collecting, um, both in collaboration with and sometimes without the, the knowledge of artists. And um, those things have become controversial over the years in, in many cases, and Ponza became very defensive about them. But um, it's very important as part of the study to face them uh, squarely, which is what we've tried to do uh, over the course of, of a number of years, and to try to solve the problems that came with those controversial actions uh, that Ponza did make. Um, so part of what we're going to tell you about uh, that very, very much concerns um, Ponza's re relationship to these artists and to their work and uh, decisions that he made with them and, and without them about the, the way the work looks and how it's installed and, it's, it's, um, in, and, the, and, the, and the future of the work that was in his hands. Um, but we also, at the same time, want to emphasize the fact, I think it can't be said enough, that Ponza was a pioneering collector, visionary really, uh, back in the 60s and 70s when he was buying minimal and post-minimal art in particular right out of galleries and out of artist studios. Uh, he was one of a very small group of people who were doing that at the time and he did it with in incredible passion, great intensity, and the collection that he amassed uh, is, for the most part, quite remarkable. And many, many of those things uh, found their way to the Guggenheim, and it's, um, it's been a, a, an incredible boon, obviously, to the, to the museum collection, and it's something that, um, that uh, it remains uh, a kind of brilliant crown jewel. Mm -hmm. And many of the mm. circumstances where Ponza was making decisions that were then kind of later on seen as very controversial or led to some of the works being contested mm. are in some ways rooted in the period of art itself and the changing terms of work and the way it was being produced and the changing terms of the way in which artworks were transferred um, via sale. Um, and in the case of Judd and Flavin, this is emerging um, in the early, early and mid-60s, um, and Ponza represents a person who's interacting with them in ways that weren't necessarily uh, typical to their other standard modes of, of transfer of sale. Yeah, and that, um, so that goes to the fact that, as most of you in this room know, um, work from this period uh, distinguishes itself from most work of, the, of the, the history of Western art up until that period of time because it is made um, in, in a new way. It is made uh, with non-fine art materials, mostly derived from industrial manufacture and uh, commodity culture. Uh, and it's, it's made in, mo in most, if not all, cases um, by associates and, and, and shops and agents who are not the artists themselves, but who are enlisted by the artist to, um, to produce or to fabricate the work. So there's no question, unless occasionally there is, of the artist's hand, of authorship in that sense. And that's one of the reasons why, but that, the fact that the materials don't really show the hand in the conventional sense 
And the fact that work um, took this form and fabrication took this form, and also the fact that work changed hands often on paper before it was actually produced as an object, which is something we'll get to in a second. All of these things contribute to the circumstances of, of um, not only historically of this, of this profoundly important moment in the history of art, uh, but also the circumstances of confusion to a certain degree uh, between Panza and the artists in question. And the artists, we should name some of the ones in the collection. We didn't do that. Or, or uh, is that coming up? just saying the, the case studies we've done. Yeah, but, um, which was um, Lawrence Wiener, Bruce Nauman, Donald Judd, Dan Flavin, and, um, Doug, Wheeler, and Doug Wheeler, and, Robert and others. Irwin, Robert Irwin, Sarah, Andre. Right, right. So that's the, those are the, 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 the figures that we've been kind of working with. We're going to give you a, a sort of slice of that today. And I would just add, I mean, looking at mm. works that are kind of emblematic of this shift, um, you know, commercially available materials and industrially produced materials quite often, um, you know, mm. assembled by fabricators, it kind of identifies new modes of fragility in the art, um, but it also opens up um, possibilities in some cases for replication, which, you know, as we touched on this morning, of course, it's just a, a sort of hornet's nest of questions and, and possibilities, um, each coming with, you know, kind of grave responsibilities on the part of the caretakers. But it's, it's a deeply rooted in what we were attempting to explore and come to some definitive um, conclusions about in the course of the study. Yeah, and I, I guess I couldn't help but notice this morning that we had two questions, one from Ursula and one from a gentleman from the Mike Kelly Foundation uh, that kind of represent the two extremes of the problem of, of the copy, um, and uh, which is something that is kind of where we find ourselves in, the, in between those two things, something we, where we find is, 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 a, is a place we find ourselves in the context of the study. One extreme is the emotional um, resistance to the idea of the copy as being uh, anything like the so-called original, uh, with which we have a lot of sympathy for in, in many ways. Uh, and the other is the idea that so much of the work wasn't made by the artist anyway, uh, in the case of the work that we're dealing with, and certainly in the case of Mike Kelly, some of it was, some of it wasn't, the materials aren't conventional fine art materials, that copies don't really even perhaps matter, they may not be problematic at all. And I would say this sort of a sliding scale in that context is what we would like to explore to a certain degree. Um, and in some today. cases, the copies in fact embraced. It's a very, um, you know, kind of central, uh, utility that the artist embraces. I mean, Nauman does very much accept the copies of the neon works, and as we'll discuss a little in a moment, um, you know, his rooms and corridors are, are it's, it's a necessity to, to make them each time they're shown. So we'll kind of get to that. Um, but one of the other things to highlight of what came uh, sort of to the fore in this moment, and particularly with Panza as a, as a kind of actor in this way, um, was this role of paperwork, an increasing kind of presence and, um, and function of sales contracts, certificates of authenticity, installation instructions, um, purchase orders with fabricators, all of these documents kind of create this constellation of um, documentation that inform terms of sale, terms of transfer, um, but you know, we look to, in some ways, to understand the kind of authentic identity of the work and the way in which it can be um, perpetuated. And of course, one document um, is the certificate of authenticity. And we, we show one example that's representative um, from Flavin's practice, Dan Flavin's practice. Um, but each artist kind of developed their own uh, style that was unique to the way that they were, uh, the, the sort of problem solving that they were attempting to do mm -hmm. and, and the usefulness of the certificate. Um, in Flavin's case, uh, it was there to accompany transfer of sale. You can see that the certificate doesn't uh, hold you know, the sort of recipe or DNA about producing this artwork. The medium line is simply the fluorescent light. The dimensions are just listed with one aspect, the height of the object, but of course the object does exist in three dimensions. So um, these, these documents each kind of create a facet of understanding about the artwork, um, but of course, you know, do play a very crucial role in their transmission. Yeah, so one of the things that happens in this context of delegated fabrication, um, industrial rather than fine art materials, and paper, paperwork, commercial, legal, and, and other, uh, is uh, there a, a, a sort of um, 
place of, uh, of, of um, potential confusion emerges, especially early on, and keep in mind that Ponza was acquiring these things when they were brand new, and it's our belief that the artists themselves, never mind the collector, had not completely caught up to the implications of ownership uh, and authenticity in the context that, that we're describing. Um, so this realm, this area of so-called confusion emerges wherein Ponza, the, the collector, believed, him, uh, he, believed that he was um, licensed by his ownership of the work and the way in which it changed hands on paper um, before, in, not always, but often in cases uh, on paper before um, being, having been produced uh, as a kind of collectible, preservable object. Um, that situation allowed Ponza, he felt, a certain degree of latitude with respect to the way in which he addressed the object as either unique on the one hand or very much not unique on the other. So it's true in, in Flavin's case that a work can be remade uh, with, no real, um, uh, with no real negative impact on the nature of, of the identity of the work itself. Uh, but if, it's, if, it's, if that's done, um, According to the according to rules that um, that if it, it can be done correctly according to rules that are that are um, established by the artist, but if it's done uh, without the artist's knowledge, um, there are it's possible, which is something the Ponza believed he could do, is possible to make mistakes. At which point you've completely t violated uh, the terms of the, the 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 terms that we associate with the identity of the work and the idea of authenticity. So here's a case where this work that we showed you started with the certificate of, of authenticity and, the, and, the, and one version of the work itself. Um, it's a case where a work was, was um, remade in different ways uh, at Pons's behest, not, not at Flavin's behest, when it was loaned from one exhibition to another. Um, instead of shipping frequently objects of this kind, exhibition copies were permitted in some cases, or permission was take, was was um, granted assumed. to assumed yeah. by granted to himself by Panza uh, to to make an exhibition copy or have one made by somebody else, even though it was unsupervised by Flavin or him, uh, on the site of the of the show. Mm -hmm. And these are multiple examples of of of, of cases of different versions of this work, uh, most of which differ from each other. Uh, in one case, the colors, Ponza actually uh, appears to have authorized changing the order of the, of, the, of the colors from whatever it was, pink, yellow, blue, green, to you can see it uh, down below, to yellow, pink, blue, red. He added red when there was no red in the, in the original conception of the work. Uh, and uh, it was also installed in different ways, both, uh, both for, 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 for good and for bad. Uh, and in one instance as well, it was reproduced on the cover of an art magazine um, upside down, uh, which is uh, also to say that there is a, um, there's a, a, a broader degree to which um, the, the object can be misunderstood uh, because of the, of the nature of it as being both extremely schematic and abstract and also uh, so new. And just a, um, you know, Panza had a very, very um, active um, history of exhibiting his collection throughout Europe um, before the works um, came into the Guggenheim collection. So as Jeffrey's pointing out, he made choices where the works weren't necessarily presented in accordance to how the artists would have um, wanted them displayed. Um, and in many cases, the artists weren't necessarily aware that the works were being displayed. But this is just, uh, we want the, wanted this here to highlight um, the kind of level and frequency of the activity that Panza had around exhibiting his own collection in Europe. Um, and that it's really part of the transmission of art um, it, throughout Europe for this, for this period. Yeah, it can't be said enough. I think that even when Panza made mistakes, the works were shown and they now belong to the history of those artists' works, again, for, 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 for better and worse. Uh, and that's something that art historians rarely um, actually um, um, address uh, in the context of the transmission of the work, not just to, um, to critics and to the general public, but to other artists who saw these shows and who took lessons from American art of this period back to their own um, practice. So I don't know if you want to, um, we're, we're just, we're, we're now going to move, that was kind of the, an attempt at the most concise introduction mm -hmm. um, when we, we uh, 
the, the project has been kind of vast in its scope, and of course it's you know, now going into its eighth year, so we're attempting to summarize it as, as efficiently as possible, but we did want to highlight sort of five themes um, and show examples um, from four different artists that a, attempt to kind of just illustrate this and open it up for discussion later. Um, but we should say that this is, this is a, a representative sample uh, from the kind of material that we've been examining and producing as part of the project. So the first is, I guess, <clears throat> I don't have the themes in front of me, autonomous object, uh, um, which refers to um, our, 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 our example today is um, it's one that's become notorious on the project. It's called Corner Piece by Robert Morris, and it's, it's actually a, a pyramid of, uh, made of plywood, where it was once. Um, in 1964, it was shown for the first time, conceived by Morris and shown in the Green Gallery at the so-called plywood show, a very famous show in the history of, of um, of minimal art, um, and, uh, and it was um, then uh, it, uh, destroyed, basically. It was dismantled by the artist. It's something that I didn't know until I was doing the work on this project is that uh, those early exhibitions by Morris were not preserved, uh, as famous as they are. We know them always through these same two or three photographs. The objects themselves were rarely, if ever, preserved unless they were acquired, which very few were at the time. The artist couldn't bring them back to his studio, he had no space for them, and he really didn't care about them as unique objects at the time, although he had not formulated a system yet with respect to what that means. So in the case of Corner Piece and all the other works you saw in that previous photograph, they were dismantled, the raw material was brought back to the studio, um, and some of it was reused or recycled for future work. Mm -hmm. And he was making those mm -hmm. objects himself at the time out of quarter inch plywood and nailing them together and then painting, painting. them on site in the gallery and you know he, he spoke about even going every few days to roll on another coat of paint to keep them looking very um, fresh. <laughs> Ponza um, purchased... This is what we now refer to as toast. I think this in oh the term <laughs> has been introduced. Yeah. Um. Ponza, um, Ponza purchases the work from Morris in an unrealized form um, via these sales agreements that he had with artists um, in 1967 by which time Morris has moved on and no longer is constructing these large gray forms in plywood and instead has become, begun to um, prefer fiberglass to achieve uh, what he wants in this body of work. So this, you're seeing the innards of the object that the Guggenheim received from um, Ponza at the time of the acquisition. And so it's missing its front face, which has its own Which set we of, have. But which we do we have. have. Um, and which has its own set of uh, conservation problems um, one being some kind of cracking, but also that at one point in an installation, um, somebody thought it was just going to be a useful sol pro solution um, to install it, putting screws through the face of it. So it has some it has some substantial issues, and along with many of the other works in the collection by Morris, and we undertook um, a very comprehensive series of um, sort of five or six interviews with Morris over the course of about two years. Um, each time examining works in person with him to try to get a sense of uh, material considerations, um, questions about preferred medium, questions about future refabrications, um, and the you know, display parameters, et cetera. And I have to say, I think we came away with a lot more questions than we um, than answers. So there are, there are many topics now at stake in this particular example. One has to do with artist interviews, which something that hasn't come up yet, but it's related to the question of, you know, artists alive and then posthumous questions that can't be, can no longer be answered. In any case, this is an example of having perhaps gone almost too far. We, we interviewed him at great length multiple times over the course of several years. And, but what we found uh, is that the same questions were producing different answers. Uh, and that the artist himself, never having been confronted before with these questions, hadn't really completely worked his way through the implications of them for his legacy, um, but that in talking to us was coming to kind of change his mind again and again, which is, was for, for us kind of, um, it was both you know, uh, confusing but also extremely interesting. And it, and it came to the point wherein we were talking to him about material questions that the critics of the, of the 60s claimed to be, um, um, to be irrelevant to the, to the, as many of you know, who know the history of this kind of work, irrelevant to the function and meaning of the work. Um, those questions turned out to be much more engaging to Morris now than they, they might have been once before. And it told us that mm -hmm. even at the time, his material choices mattered more in, 
mattered more than historians and conservators have been willing to kind of face or admit or even knew. And even, even he himself. I mean, he was startled by his own embrace or attachment to certain choices of medium um, over the years. Yeah, and it should be said that he started out, this is a case where delegated fabrication came to him eventually, but he started out making these objects himself. And the ones he made, we have, the Guggenheim now holds examples of things that he made as well as things that were made by others. It's a long story, but basically uh, the ones that he himself made, he recognized in storage and had a different kind of re human response to uh, than he then to the to the works that were made by others, which which then in basically in instigated a kind of self-critical moment of, re of 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 pulling back. At which point he he said, "I'm now saying things that I'm not supposed to say." You know, in relation to this body of work, it was it was um, it was it was all extremely right. useful to us and really really interesting historically. Well, it, speaks to, well. it speaks to the question asked this morning about the act of observing. Um, affecting the, the thing that you're attempting to observe objectively. And we, we really came up against a process with him where it was clear, um, you know, we were all kind of going going into deeper waters than we thought we, we would. Yeah, and you can see that he got shorter over the course of yeah. the, sorry. <laughs> so basically, to move, we have to move away from the corner piece because it, it too could occupy the entire time. Basically, the, the upshot is that Ponza bought a, from Morris, an object that was not from the original show in 1964, or the, I should now say the first show, because Morris claims there's no such thing as an original, that the idea is the original, and everything else is a copy of the, of, of the idea. Basically, everything else is every object that's ever been made that's corner pieces of replication. There are, as you see, a number of them. Uh, they took different forms over the years, uh, and Ponza himself uh, came to acquire one that was made from a material that differed from the original in 19, the so-called first version or first copy in 1964. Uh, and Morris changed his mind again about materials over the course of, uh, of, 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 of several decades of having this work kind of included and re-included in exhibitions all over the world. Uh, and there's another topic to flag, which is the fact that artists, uh, and this for me was maybe the biggest revelation of the study, that artists um, we take this for granted, but it, it, we can't. Artists address their own work differently over time, and if the work was a, if a work originates in '64, but it gets it gets remade in different ways and shown in different ways in '74 and '84 and '94, what happens to the identity the identity of the work? Do we value the way it was in '64 only, or largely, or mostly, or do we accept the fact that the practice, which changed over time, mm -hmm. departed from those initial kind of precepts? and developed into something else, which allowed for multiplicity and change. And the most recent final slide from Morris, the most recent example of this is the, is the um, DIA uh, installation of the so-called Green Gallery show, mm -hmm. which they acquired as, I don't know if anybody from DIA is here, um, which they acquired as, the as if it was a single installation in 64, about which there's a lot of historical debate. Um, so there is now a brand new uh, version of the of every object that was in the Green Gallery show uh, made like a year ago, with under Mar of course under Morris's supervision, including corner piece, which the Guggenheim was under the impression that it owned. Right. Um, so Jeffrey and I called each other. You know, we read it in the New York Times at the same moment in the morning, just going, "Did you, did you see this? Did you see yeah, this?" Yeah, because <clears throat> we were uninformed. Um, <laughs> After, after talking to the artist for now amounts to five years, and some of our best friends work at DIA, um, this, this happened you know, without our knowledge. But that became part of the history of the project and part of the history of the work. And we thought it was, turned out to be interesting um, it, it, to, make a, to use a euphemism. Right. Um, um, so we, we want to move on to our next uh, sort of theme, so to speak, and look at a group of works um, in the Ponza Holdings um, represented by Nauman rooms and corridors. And these are works that are sort of never meant to be retained in any one given form. They're meant to be remade each time they're situated. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, they're, they're you know, kind of full-scale architectural um, entities, you know, actual constructed rooms, actual constructed <coughs> corridors that are meant to be, um, you know, constructed with just basic, uh, really sort of local, generic, um, construction methods and some, in some cases, some lighting equipment. And here you see the, the drawing that Nauman produced um, for the piece. And Ponza acquired um, many of these works and really insisted at the time to acquire at the same time 
um, all of the accompanying drawings around the rooms and corridors that he was um, accumulating, and all of those materials came to the Guggenheim, so we end up having this very, very rich uh, holding of Nauman drawings as well. Um, but they end up being the kind of guiding document, of course, in thinking about how these are fabricated um, over time. And one interesting um, thing to just demonstrate is that in, in some cases, Nauman produced versions of these rooms or corridors in his studio and then either made drawings of them or produced um, photographs. And there's, there's some sets of um, really quite beautiful Polaroid images of some of these early constructions. And they tell us a little bit about the sensibility and configuration of the corridor in, in sort of Nauman's first instantiation. Um, in the case of Green Light Corridor, um, it, there's also the case where there's a very early iteration of it that is seen kind of as almost this gospel of, um, uh, of, of, of a heightened achievement of what the piece was in its sort of ideal state in that it was installed and it was perfectly contained between the floor and the ceiling, hence having no need for any additional bracing. Um, and it was also positioned um, whereby a person entering the corridor would exit and be immediately confronted with a beautiful panorama looking out onto the Pacific Ocean, thereby intensifying the kind of af natural after effect of being bombarded with the green fluorescent light and being you know, sort of washed with the light coming off the Pacific Ocean to have this very intense rose afterglow. Um, so we have this as an example um, of something that Nauman is on record of really liking. Um, but we also have nearly, I think, two dozen examples of how this work has been realized over time. We don't have the objects we have. We have, don't, we have the record, record photographic them. record and mm. some um, kind of construction drawings, some during Ponzo's period of ownership and um, quite a number of cases where the work has been borrowed uh, by other lenders uh, during the period of Guggenheim ownership. And there's a wide variety of ways in which this has been realized, um, some incorrectly, some correctly. Um, in each case, there's a you know, whole degree, host of um, kind of practical problem solving that goes along with how to cite this piece, how to construct it, um, how to deal with structural questions, and of course, sourcing the materials and the lighting equipment. Um, and we are tasked with trying to encapsulate a very open spirit of the work um, because, of course, there's many, many acceptable iterations of what this work can be, um, but also attempting to kind of guide um, and prevent um, incorrect interpretations when it's loaned. And we should point out that when it is borrowed, it's not the case where someone from the museum goes to necessarily supervise. The borrower is then kind of tasked to, I mean, they give us drawings and send us photographic evidence, but it's really up to the borrower to, to do the problem solving and understand how to construct this. So we're there to handhold a little bit, but it's put us in a position to, to need to um, articulate um, and, and encapsulate what the terms are for display and construction. Which we have done in consultation with Nauman Studio, with Bruce himself, but also primarily really his assistant, his amazing assistant, Julia Myers. Um, but which became its own kind of minefield, which process became its own kind of minefield mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, while you basically do, as Francesca was saying, want to maintain the idea of openness and variability, which is uh, intrinsic to uh, work of this kind, on the one hand, you're also trying to draw lines that prevent it from being something it doesn't want to be. And that's a judgment call, mm -hmm. A, on our part, B, it's something about which the artist and his assistant have had different things to say over time. So we can't get into it in great, in great detail, um, but I think you get the kind of picture. Um, the fact is that where those parameters should be drawn is something that's subject to its own level of debate. And it's one thing to say, as Christian did, that you know, the artist approves of X and Y, and, um, and therefore things are OK. But I, I do feel that sometimes uh, we are in danger of taking the artist's word uh, as a kind of holy writ uh, wrongly, uh, and that challenging artists can be useful too, uh, because over the years, historically, this work has, in fact, changed forms. In some cases, the artist was unhappy with, an, with a version of it that later he came to kind of feel was probably okay after all. All of these things we think, and maybe we overthink, uh, but, it's, but we, we come to feel that someone has to overthink because um, we're, we were, both of us, I think, used to in, in our professional lives taking for granted these things instead. Some of these things are 
um, uh, or, we, or we think uh, important to, the, to, the, uh, understand, to understanding the, the work and, and to creating a safe future for it. And again, not just safe with respect to restrictions, but safe also with respect to healthy, um, uh, healthy, healthy latitude births or, or openness. Mm -hmm. And I, we also want to bring up the case of precedent, which we'll speak about a little bit more. Um, but it's at stake for Nauman's corridors as well, because just backing up a tiny bit, any of the corridors and rooms um, that have been fabricated incorrectly were quite often photographed and published and are then kind of out in the world and, and are not infrequently then used as guide, you know, kind of default guidelines um, for choices to be made. And we wanted to um, highlight that there is a kind of aesthetic um, condition at, pl at stake for Nauman's work and just to show um, a very, very early kind of Nauman supervised fabrication of one of the corridor works that's in the collection and then a version that was produced by Ponza in a very, very kind of heightened, refined, almost sort of Italian designed furniture um, aesthetic, um, which we know from Nauman um, to be absolutely, um, you know, sort of outside his preferences. He much prefers a more um, direct uh, modest construction aesthetic. Um, but again, you know, this question of precedent comes into play um, when these things have been out in the world and there's a little bit of a, a risk of perpetuation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this, I, now we're talking about, does that we, now I mean was, I think our category was remakeable installation. Yeah, and this now is we're at precedent and site. Precedent and site. So the question is, um, in, the, in the case of work of this period, uh, as you know, a, a, a lot of it is, intended to function in relation to the space of the room, uh, and it, that's, that's built into the nature of the work by the artist, of course, who usually installs such a work or conceives such a work the first time it's installed. I'm generalizing, but it tends to be true. Um, but who then uh, is asked to reinvent, sorry, reinvent or reimagine that aspect of the work, its relationship to, the, to actual space, uh, in other contexts along the way based on exhibition requests, et cetera. Um, so this is something that is intrinsic to the nature of the work. Its adaptability from one site to another is completely essential to the, to the, to the language of the work um, and to the, to the way it functions with respect to the beholder. Um, and this is a case of a work that's um, untitled to Jan and Ron Greenberg that had several manifestations early on. And that was then acquired by Ponza, sold by Flavin through a dealer to Ponza with the understanding that it would be remade in a permanent setting, probably in one of Ponza's future buildings that were going to be converted into museums, this never really happened. Yeah, so you're laughing because this is exactly uh, the, the other, the, this is the, the dark side, so to speak, of what can happen in that context, which is that Ponza then felt uh, that he was at liberty to lend the work when it was requested for exhibitions and also to include it in collection shows of his own collection, uh, but also to adapt that work, this work in particular and others, to, um, to, to the new site on his own uh, without, um, without uh, requesting uh, permission from Flavin and certainly without collaborating with Flavin on, um, on, an author, on a so-called authorized version. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this would be just about the worst thing you can do to, to, to this particular work, which is a barrier piece that is supposed to be sealed off uh, from between, it's supposed to seal off access from one space to another, uh, but not be installed in a, in a vaulted ceiling and made to look uh, like a completely different kind of uh, sort of impressionistic light show. And I uh, will add briefly before we, mo we move on that Ponza actually said to Flavin in a letter, Flavin expressed his, his, his repulsion basically at the moves that Ponza made in this case uh, and at the results, although he didn't actually go to see this, so he was, he was responding to things he had been told. Uh, but Ponza wrote back to Flavin a placating letter that said, I think you would like it if you saw it. It's really even better than it was when you made it. <laughs> Um, but we're going to move on to look at another work mm. by Flavin in the Ponza collection mm. that, you know, I guess sort of in the, in the case of even the best intentions, you know, we trip over some of these questions as well around precedent and sightedness, I guess. Um, this is indeed actually uh, Flavin's first barrier piece from 1968. Um, Ponza acquired it um, after it was first shown in St. Louis in the early 70s. Um, and as Jeffrey explained about the previous um, 
sort of yellow green piece, Ponza purchases this in um, a proposal form only. No, no equipment, no physical object is transferred at the time. Um, its first realization is for the first show at the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art in 1983, at which time um, a studio assistant from Flavin's studio goes to install this work in Los Angeles. So there's you know, absolutely a degree of supervision at that point. Um, and you can see the image of it here. Um, it's then next shown by Panza at the Reina Sofia show in Madrid, um, where at, at that occasion Panza decides to not um, engage with Flavin and, or even inform him that this is being exhibited. And this is the physical object that the, Gu that the Guggenheim received at the time of the acquisition. And it wasn't in good condition, so one unit of this modular work was utilized um, to produce a new fabrication for the museum in 1993. And at the time, um, Flavin's then studio assistant um, supervised this work on our behalf. And that new fabrication goes on to be exhibited at multiple locations around uh, Europe and Asia and, and um, the United States over the ensuing years. And it was only after we, uh, having done this very in-depth um, study, I ended up um, being a courier to take this um, work to Vienna where it was installed and we start unpacking it and putting it in the crate. I realized this is going in the wrong direction. It's stepping in the wrong direction. I couldn't make sense of what was going on because the piece had been shown so many times and went back to refer to the catalogue raisonné and indeed, you know, there's a very um, you know, clear demarcation that the work is meant to proceed from the right to the left where ours goes from the left to the right. Um, we then proceed to pursue um, producing a new fabrication, a correct, so to speak, um, fabrication of it stepping the quote unquote right way. Um, in the midst of that conversation, I got a phone call from LA Mocha who said, you know, we have this thing in storage, we're not quite sure you would be interested in it, but it looks like it's a Flavin that was here in 83, loaned by Ponza, and I said, yes, we're definitely interested, please, <laughs> please, please send it. Um, and we unpacked the crates, and it's this you know, object from 1983 produced by Flavin's studio assistant at the time. And I unpack it and I start to assemble it and it's going the wrong way. And I'm utterly baffled um, because the photograph has it going the quote right way. Which calls into question the kind of veracity of a photographic record, because of course the photo can be flipped, which this one clearly was. Um, but it also calls into question the whole notion of precedent and right and wrong and, you know, the kind of curious condition of that at two different times, representatives of Flavin Studio were there involved with either pr the production of or the installation of a version that was, you know, in theory. So if, if, if this is a mistake, then it was actually authorized by the artist himself multiple times or by his, his designated... Hitter. Um, the other question that's come up is whether or not, it's, since it's been done so many times, it counts now as a new version of the work, which is, sounds glib in a way, but I have to say, you know, the precedent is complicated also because it's vague. And while we have a, a history now of, uh, of this work being shown in multiple places in different fabrications, not all of which stepped the wrong way, the early ones stepped the right way, so to speak, were, were destroyed. Uh, back in the you know in the 60s um, you know after they were shown uh, or the 70s um, even when we have a record um, actions get taken in the complex sort of sort of way of th these collaborations work that can in fact um, contradict uh, what it was the artist himself even with the artist more or less around contradict what it was the artist himself um, had wanted to do at the outset. Um, and it actually leaves us with a lot of questions remaining about, what, about the, what's correct with respect to this work, both uh, with regard to vintage versus new, uh, vintage fabrication versus, versus a new remake, and with respect to the way in which the work um, bisects the space of the room. So along the lines of the kind of artist's record and, um, you know, dealing with the, the record um, itself, we, we were also, as we began to address the works by Judd and the Ponza collection, we were left with a very, very powerful record in that um, Judd himself published a four-part essay um, at the time that he became aware of the Guggenheim um, in active conversation uh, around a very large acquisition of minimal art from Ponza. 
and it angered him greatly, and it was an opportunity that he took to publicly go on, um, on record to denounce um, many of the activities that Ponza had taken um, as a kind of, you know, steward of works um, by Judd and his collection, um, the act of selling, transfer of sale in and of itself, um, and also many of the choices that Ponza had made in fabricating works by Judd um, without his direct authorization. And we should say that, you know, the relationship between Ponza and Judd and Giuseppe Panza and Giovanna Panza and Judd was a close one. They, um, you know, saw each other frequently, and, and Panza acquired 27 works by Judd in the 70s, um, 16 of which were unrealized uh, at the time of acquisition. So there's quite a substantial degree of good faith um, at the time, um, kind of represented by the fact that these works transferred, or 16 of the 27 works were transferred. Um, only in the sales agreement form with very kind of scant or limited detail about the work itself. Um, however, also with quite a, a broad permissibility around fabrication and even refabrication. Um, however, we should note that the document, the sales document also stipulated um, authorization by the artist was required and that it was contingent upon um, the artist providing to Panza um, detailed um, instructions about uh, fabrication. And those detailed instructions were provided um, in the case of only four works um, and uh, produced by Peter Ballantyne, the Judd's longtime um, fabricator for works and plywood. Um, and they're very, very detailed documents that describe issues related to you know, joinery and um, materials and fasteners. And Ponza utilized them. Um, to produce works in plywood. He also produced works in um, hot rolled steel and copper and some other materials. But the plywood works um, were done in such a way that um, Judd eventually, via studio assistants going to see the objects in person and being shown photographs of them, responded to Ponza saying that he had gotten them quite wrong. And we should say that for someone who's not necessarily familiar with Judd's works in plywood, um, they're not necessarily going to jump out at you as being so drastically wrong. Um, but for anyone familiar with the kind of quality and detail of Judd's fabrications in plywood, there, there's quite a lot about the Ponza fabrications that differ substantially um, from Judd's authentic work, bo both the material um, itself that were used uh, that was used to produce the pieces, and then. Um, down to the joinery and fasteners and a lot of the um, kind of specificity of the, of the construction details. And this extended both to um, uh, these kind of longer room installation works as well. There's a work in, co in copper that came to us in such severely compromised condition that of course it wasn't anything we could consider displaying, but it itself also had um, kind of fabrication flaws that, that discredited it basically. Right. And I, I guess I, 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 as we get to the, to the end, and we're almost there, uh, I want to flag yet another question that came up this morning, which I think is relevant now in, in, in this context, which is the question which I think really kind of went unanswered uh, about the influence or the impact of, um, of, of stories like this, of, of events like this, um, on the future of the work and on the legacy, which is vast in this case, really, um, in some respects, because um, the, the disputes that Judd had with Ponza over this became permanent scars between them uh, and destroyed, basically destroyed the relationship and also made Judd make other decisions, we feel, in, in the context of his practice that he had failed to make with respect to, to Ponza. So here's a case where Ponza actually, the actions that they took between them and then Ponza's actions independently did influence the um, the nature of the artist's practice in a very specific and important way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, we just also wanted to point out that um, Ponza wasn't able to produce fabrications of all of the works that he had purchased in <coughs> the sort of sales agreement form. So as part of the Guggenheim acquisition, which we should point out took place still during Judd's lifetime, um, there were seven works which remained totally unrealized. So these are also works in our collection that we were tasked with kind of looking at. And, and yeah, go ahead. And, and just um, finally, uh, in addition to the works by Judd, there's many, many other examples, um, two of which are here, one by Dan Flavin and one by Robert Irwin, that represent um, other works that share uh, kind of similar limitations 
with uh, regard to incomplete information. Uh, so we're literally in a position with a, with a, either in the case of Flavin, an artist is no longer is living, um, to not be able to kind of complete the, the, the snapshot of what this work could be. Um, or in the case of Irwin and some other artists, um, you know, a contested um, acquisition um, on, the, on the part of between Ponza and Irwin. Yeah, and the final thing to say on that is that um, with respect to the idea of the identity of the work and the status of the work or the status of the object, what is it in a case like this that the Guggenheim owns? Because in fact, these things were either acquired by the Guggenheim from Ponza or given by Ponza to the museum. So this idea of what the work really is and, and, what, and whether or not it belongs to the, to the, to the, to the domain of, of potential ownership and stewardship is itself an open question, so uh, we probably forever. And we, <coughs> um, you know, tasked with, the, with a part of this project being attempting to, to come to some degree of resolution on behalf of the museum around these works with contested status or, you know, kind of this dormancy, <coughs> uh, we decided to create a new collection category that would in a way kind of contain, corral, hold these works um, and allow them to remain as either historic um, artifacts that could be utilized for future research um, or obviously just historic records in the cases of works where there wasn't an extant object. Um, and we called that category decommission. And we established this with um, the approval of the trustees of the museum and kind of intensive debate and discussion amongst the staff um, I don't know if you want to add yeah, and we're, we're out of time, and we have one last thing to say, but I'm just, just to kind of, you know, to, to complete that thought, um, basically the idea was, sorry, to, to create a place in the collection where works that, are no, that were once thought to be viable but no longer are could live and still belong to history and to the history of the, of the collection and to the history of the artist's practice, but not be mistaken for works that could either be fabricated without the, without the collaboration of the artist, uh, which is going to be unforthcoming or impossible because of, we're talking about a posthumous situation, uh, or shown in, in the case of objects that's, that were extant uh, but belong to this category. These are, these are objects themselves that, that, that potentially still exist but are kept from being shown as authentic, as so-called authentic examples of the artist's work. But it begs the question, which we can talk about in Q&A, uh, if ever, uh, of uh, authenticity and what it really means, because that, too, what we think as a principle belongs to a kind of sliding scale in the context of work of this kind. And we just will end mm. on However, the note of... Um, <laughs> so we lost a lot of work to the decommission <laughs> category because Ponza acquired, for example, Francesco was saying 16 works from Judd on paper unrealized, none of which can be, according to the rules that seem to be, uh, that, that, the, that the community accepts with respect to the estate uh, and others, other stakeholders, uh, none of which can, be, can now be fabricated because he's gone. Um, so a good number, a, num a large number of works by Judd no longer have a future, we presume, uh, and a number of works by other artists belong to that category as well. Mm -hmm. However, we just, and we'll end on this note, that um, mm. Ponza at the time of the first show at LA MOCA, at the same time uh, having loaned the Flavin Barrier, also mm. loaned a work in plywood by Judd. Um, that was originally um, displayed by Judd in 1974. And Judd um, had Peter Ballantyne, his approved um, plywood fabricator, produce this object, travel to Los Angeles, install it there. And we had repeatedly asked Mocha to please check to see if this in some way had lingered in your storage um, and you know, had always gotten the reply that no, nothing, nothing had, um, had survived. But when I got the phone call about the Flavin Barrier, I said, would you mind just checking one more time for that Judd piece, and within two hours, I got a call back saying, "Yep, we have it, and we'll <laughs> send it to you." Um, so just to really so fast a, forward, the registrar conversation in here somewhere yeah. too, but we can't. Have but that. we, and this is this is us doing a kind of experimental um, assembly inspection um, of it in our warehouse, um, and we had to go through the exercise of recommissioning a piece that we had decommissioned, and it included a conversation with the Judd Foundation and a kind of blessing of them to bestow authenticity on this work again. So the category of decommission in this case permitted the so-called recommission of something that was, uh, th that was, that is recoup could be recuperated because a so-called authentic uh, version of it, it did exist. Uh, one authorized by judge, shown with his permission 
and um, and then save loss for a while, and then and then and then um, re when it resurfaced, came back into the possession of the Guggenheim because it acquired that work from Ponza, even though there was only bad fabrications that Ponza had made for other shows. With the arrival of this authentic fabrication from 1983, the work now is um, basically resurrected, has a new life and, a, and, a, and a, an authentic future. Thank you. Thank you.